Hello, everybody, and welcome to Outcomes the Sun radio and podcast. We are thrilled to be here once again. We're, you know, Melissa, I'm here with my co-host. I'm sorry, like if you don't know this, my amazing co-host, Melissa Yamaguchi, and I'm Marielle Hemingway, and we talk about mental health as it pertains to everything in the world. Everything. <laughs> even even plants. Your thoughts, to your physicality, to everything, everything, everywhere. Um, so, you know, uh, we both have watched very interesting documentaries lately that yeah. have been about sports and people in sports and, and kind of what I'd like you to dive into what you saw and then I'll tell you what I saw. <laughs> when I, and I saw, I saw two, one was on, um, the, the entertainment industry. One was on Tanya Tucker. And it was a show that was produced by Brandy Carlisle. Cause Brandy felt like Tanya Tucker was so instrumental in influencing a lot of the music that's out today with, with country and Western and, and the young gals probably don't even know how, where that influence came from. So she kind of, Tanya Tucker didn't want to call it a comeback. She wanted to call it a refresh, but she did a <laughs> whole episode on Tanya Tucker and I, what I found fascinating, aside from the fact that after being gone from the music industry for almost 18 years, she stepped right in front of that mic and still was able to belt out music like she could back when she was, you know, a younger gal. And she'd been singing since she was 9, 10, 11. So the, the, um, the thing that I found, aside from her really raw gift and talent, was she talked about her mental health struggles and how you know, maybe being so young in that industry and being exposed to so much, <coughs> excuse me, I apologize. Um, being exposed to so much was d more difficult than, than even she or her parents were prepared for back then. Mm -hmm. And her father was her manager. And, and although I'm sure he felt he was protecting her, she said he was, he was tough. He was a tough protector. Right. He still couldn't protect her from all of that work. She was tired a lot. There's a scene where she's curled up in her mom's lap and she looks like she's probably 11, 12 and her mom's holding on to her and, her, and someone on the off camera said, what are you thinking right now? And she said, my baby needs to stay a little girl. Like she's holding on to her daughter. And so she talks about her struggles with mental health. And I don't think a lot of us, you know, realize we knew that Tanya Tucker had had, a, had trouble um, with substance abuse. And we knew that she had, she, that was kind of her remedy for all the pain that she was experiencing going through all this and missing out on childhood. But we didn't realize that, that, that substance abuse for her really was her crutch. And now that she was trying, she was somewhat clean. They still show her picking up tequila and drinking a shot before she sings to build up her nerves, as she says it's it's affected her mental health and and one of the things that i that i've learned is that the three areas of your brain that are most affected by drugs being the basal ganglia extended amygdala and the prefrontal cortex yep, well yep. the extended amygdala is is hit the hardest with certain drugs and that's what causes anxiety it doesn't allow you to see hope and and, and future and to be able to calm yourself down outside of the 2 minute panic that you're having or 10 minute panic right. So the fact that she was never, that prefrontal cortex is developed in late teen years, early twenties. So if she had been introduced to drugs or if she had been, a, her brain had been traumatized from the excessive work and being thrown into a grown up world and having to make grown up decisions. I mean, she's saying Delta Dawn about a 40, 41 year old woman when she was 11. So she was, her brain wasn't able to have that full development. Right. And so now you see her trying to substitute areas that may be missing with the abuse, the substance and still drinking, even I, though she doesn't classify it as abuse. But that was a I mean, it's really worth watching. It's she it's 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 watching to celebrate her talent that she still has. It's also also worth watching to understand um, what this does to the to a person. Well, and, I, you know, I mean, I, you can't make light of the fact that when one's childhood is sort of taken from them, even though the intention is good and a child may right. say, that's what I want, whatever. I mean, I, I know for myself, I was a caregiver for my mother and I watched, you know, addict, uh, you know, alcoholic parents, you know, managing their lives. And I chose to be that because I thought that that was the best choice for job in, in my life. But what that does to you 
in your development is very challenging. It's yes. very challenging, but you don't, of course you don't know it. You just know that, gosh, it would be nice if I could just rest. If, if, if yeah. I didn't have to be up in the middle of the night to clean up or whatever. Right. right? And she probably like, I, it was, would have been nice if she could just go to school like a regular kid, not you know, have a performance or this or that. And then what, what happens is that addiction comes along to be, it be, at first it's, it's not just a crutch at first, at first it, it's really helpful because it does, it gives her like, yep. like she says yep. now, it gives her that courage. It gives her the yep. courage to go on stage and go, okay, I can handle this. It's just interesting. And, and, and we, we need to be super conscious of how we push our kids, yep. you know, and, and it goes back to, you know, we talked about this in another um, episode of the show, you know, not praising, oh. praising the kids act, but, but looking at the activity and encouraging more of the activity, like, oh, keep, keep going. You're, you know, this is great. Keep going. You've, you know, you're making progress and all that stuff and say of saying you're so great because probably her life was all about high expectations all the time. Right. And then you never, it, it, you feel as though you've got to live up to that. I mean, I think of my grandfather, he's like, I got to live up to, I wrote this book that's done all I got to live up to that. I got to, you know, I've got to constantly find the danger zone, the place where I'm so on edge and, and alcohol and drugs are often, you know, my sister, you know, they're often just a way to make yourself feel as though you can achieve that height of yeah. greatness again. It's yeah. interesting. It's super yeah. interesting. So we also watched, um, documentaries on sports uh as i was saying i watched one called angel city that natalie portman uh she was an executive producer she was also kind of the narrator and she started something she started something and it's for it's women's soccer and she is part of a group of women not just her but very talented women in and in, uh, in the that really put professional women's soccer on the map in in the states because it's huge in europe and nobody even knows it exists here in the states and these are major athletes and it's just i found it very interesting because they were really talking about how women you know we just and it's it's so funny here we are in america but people are so you know marginalized yes. when it comes to athleticism here when it, if it's not you know nfl or whatever we just we don't value sometimes the importance of uh, of the of our sports idols that can be women and they and they you know they brought gosh they brought uh they had to bring in at least eight thousand into this you know into this uh stadium and they yeah. they filled the stadium it was like 20,000 people but the, it was a huge undertaking and you know nobody believed in them and you know when it came to their their uh uniforms like somebody was going to back it for a million dollars and other sports teams it, that sounds like a lot of money other sports teams gets get hundreds of millions oh, yeah. of that support them so it's just very interesting that journey of trying and and i'm not it's not like a women's lib thing it's it's about it's about these women work so hard these are major athletes that need to be taken seriously and i, I just found it fascinating i love that i and i the the in the theme of football i another thing show that i watched that surprised me was david beckham oh wow I, and it's worth watching. And I know that you and I are running, we don't want to eat up the time because we have an amazing guest, but we, it's, I would encourage our, our listeners to check this out. This, I never realized what this guy went through. I never right. realized how he had been tormented in sports and then how he kept, he just kept going. He kept pushing wow. himself. He didn't let the noise get in his head. Right. He just kept pushing himself forward. And he, um, it's pretty impressive to watch. It's another one worth watching. Yeah. I, I you know, I just find all of these things fascinating and you know, you were talking about him dealing with all the pressures and, you know, when people, 
you rise to fame and they want to take you down. Oh, it's yeah. very, very interesting. Oh yeah. I mean, that's a, that's a topic for another conversation that we could have in the future. I mean, we've even been talking about Kim Kardashian and, and yep. we'll talk about that another time because yep. it is actually quite fascinating how we're influenced by these people, how we love them, how we then turn the corner and we hate them. You know, like it's yes. this weird dichotomy that happens. Anyway, uh, that being said, don't go anywhere because we have a really, really sweet and wonderful guest, friend of mine, Justin Harvey next. So stay where you are or come back or go get a drink of water or go to the bathroom and do what you need to do because you got to listen. As a mental health advocate and author, I love books. Books have the capacity to inspire, educate, transform, and ultimately help readers all over the world. So if you want to publish your book or if you need help writing your story, I highly recommend Mindstir Media, rated the number one best book publisher around the country. Mindstir Media can help you no matter where you are in the book writing or publishing process. Go to mindstermedia.com to learn more and schedule a consultation. Welcome to Outcomes of Sun. Uh, if you are just tuning in, uh, we have an amazing guest. His name is Justin Harvey. He's a friend. Actually, he's a friend because I'm a friend of his mother's. Um, but that's a whole other story. We can get into that, maybe. Um, but Justin is a committed member in the recovery community of Austin, Texas. And he is an avid supporter of quality treatment for alcohol and drug abuse. Uh, he displays a high quality of integrity in his personal and professional life. Uh, he is a former Marine and has worked in the addiction field uh, and commercial construction management. His passion for helping others struggling with addiction brought him to the Arbor, uh, the Arbor Behavioral Health, and he has leadership skills and compassion for others who have who are suffering from addiction because he suffered from addiction himself, which is always, there's always some greater, deeper understanding with somebody who's been through the trenches of, of this disease. And, and we need to call that a disease. Anyway, he is excellent with client care and 12-step support services while maintaining a safe and therapeutic treatment uh, environment. So Justin, first of all, welcome. I'm so happy that you uh, have joined us here on Outcomes of Sun because we love to talk to people such as yourself that are actually making a difference in the field of recovery. And recovery, see, because I think mental health is everything, but I also think there's recovery for everyone. I don't think anything is a lost cause but you have to have the right ingredients in order for all those ingredients come together to help people. So, you know, we were talking, we were at a dinner with your, uh, your with your mom and, and your stepdad uh, not long ago. And you brought up that, you know, you're a part of the Arbor Behavioral Health and, and and really what struck me is you were like, look, these 30-day programs just don't work. And, you know, they don't work for a lot of reasons because I've been talking to people in Malibu, right? They have these recovery centers and they're exorbitantly expensive. And they're 30 days, they're $100,000, you know, like they, there's something crazy, crazy money. And they don't work because that's not long enough to change somebody's habits and belief systems and deal with their trauma. So maybe you can help us to understand a, a program that actually works for people. Do you know what I mean? Do you know what I mean? Sure, sure. I, I think what you're describing is is basically a, a holistic program, you know, and, and that's what we, when we got into the business, we wanted to create a a holistic program that addressed both mind, body, and spirit, um, yeah. you know, physical, um, as well as the, you know, the dual, di dual diagnosis, the dual issues that we're seeing in today, more prevalently in today's society uh, more than ever. Um, and uh, I think that's 
kind of the the premise of what we built the arbor around and right. um you know me and you know my family and and you know um kind of what we're capable of doing and i didn't want to create something that was kind of a spin dry kind of uh, going to maximize profits type of 30 day facility. And, right. I, and I wanted to create something that was both accessible and successful. And I wanted to create something that, um, you know, so many professionals and so many executive boards and professional boards recognize as uh, the most effective um, packaging of treatment, which is the 90 day model of treatment plus a year or even for some professional doctors and, and lawyers, five years of probation and monitoring um, after they get out of a 90 day long term treatment, which right. is what pilots require, what doctors require, what nurses require is the 90 day treatment model, which is what we know is the most successful model with the long term follow up. Right. And, right. Um, yeah. And so that's we wanted to design it around that what we know is successful. What we know that we do for professionals in this country that hold other people's lives in their hands, you know, that have to get back to work and continue to hold other people's lives in their hands. And so we wanted to create something that was uh, both successful in, in the realm of what's good for those folks, um, for those professionals, but also apply the same model to everybody else. Right. So they could get back with their, you know, loved ones and get back to their careers and get back, get back to everything that they loved so dearly and uh, make them successful on their path to recovery. Yeah. Let, let me ask you, can you kind of break down, like, let's say some, you do an intervention with some, do you do interventions with? We with, don't do specifically no. interventions. Oh, but um, say a family's done an intervention. Anyway, whatever. Mm -hmm. we Right. We we handle the inpatient but, portion. We get into the meat of what's going right. on with people. So somebody and, has arrived. What does that look like? Because I think we're curious as, you know, people who aren't addicts. Like, what is that? What does that look like when you first arrive? What is it? I mean, we've seen probably, you know, 27 days or something, you know, like, but we don't know what that what that might look like for a person. Sure. So, you know, upon arrival, you're going to go through the intake process and you're going to be uh, orientated to the program, orientated to the physical plant, orientated to your physical environment, um, grounded out with meeting with your counselors, group meeting with your, your uh, you know, you have a buddy within the community that's probably going to help a senior person that's been there that's going to help you kind of guide through the process. And then they're going to orientate everything about what's going on in the facility, what's going to be the uh, path of your, your scheduling, what's going to be happening during this process. And uh, they do some evaluation in that process. You meet with the doctors. They're going to evaluate you on the, on the mental health side. As far as the nurses, they're going to evaluate you on the, on the physical side as well, you know, just kind of coordinating those levels of care. Um, the psychologists and psychiatrists, they're going to basically evaluate where you are with your medications. They're going to evaluate where you are um, psychologically, you know, where your uh, actual well-being, where your stability is, where you are in actually grounding and, and engaging in the process and help move you into the system and help you start to engage in some healing practices. So, yeah. That's it, brilliant. Yeah. And it's, I know it's terrifying for most people. Um, and it's always the hardest thing is to pick up that phone and ask for help, you know, and, but in reality, it's, it's a lot easier process than you think. Once you're on that path, you know, um, folks on the phone, folks in the facility, we've been doing this for a long time, you know, and, and, we've well, and the time. other thing that I really loved about what you were doing is that you really, you have a program for families. And that's so huge yeah. because, you know, we're, we sort of think of the addict, the addict, the addict, or the, you know, whatever the person that takes their life, wh whomever it is, not that that's not important is of course it's important, but the families don't know how to, you know, you engage the entire family to be a part of this process, especially when they've been released after their 90 days. And that kind of continues. Am I correct? 
Sure. Yeah. So we actually start engaging with family from day one. Nice. And so we actually have uh, what's called the Arbor Family Institute. And so we have a staff of, of actual counselors that help uh, families um, get in touch with what's going on, try to figure out what the disease of addiction is, see how basically what that is in their life, what, what roles they play in that, and help them ground in the process of understanding that they have a role in this. You know what I mean? And, and not only is it not just, you know, drop my loved one off so you can fix them. Yeah. You know, it, it's a, there's a whole thing with, we're trying to figure out how the whole system works together for not only their outcomes and success, but the family's outcome and their successful relationships with their loved one as they move forward and help them navigate both the complexity of, of dealing with somebody that has maybe dual diagnosis plus addiction, uh, or if they're dealing with somebody that has, um, you know, uh, in the midst of a divorce or in some, any kind of other relational problems and how they fit into that equation and how they can help this person be more successful. Um, and then possibly look and see if, if, if they need, you know, services themselves to kind of heal from the damage that maybe has happened in their relationship or in their own core relationships. Right. And so help them kind of move in the direction of, of healthy living as well. So can I take it in a slightly different direction? I'm sorry, Melissa, I know you have a question, but I'm like, I'm so fascinated. But so because you were in the mil military, <laughs> would you say that that was the cause of your own addiction? I mean, do you think it was PTSD that led to it? Or is it a combination of many different things that led to your own problems with, you know, uh, personally, so personally, I mean, I, my addiction started when I was really young, you know, I mean, I started an, an addiction when I was living in Los Angeles and, you know, living with a single mother, you know, and, and, um, uh, trying to survive there. Uh, but, uh, coping skills, one of my coping skills to deal with the pain and suffering of dealing with everything I went through as a child, um, was drugs and alcohol. And I learned that very young that um, that was something that helped me cope with the world. And I use that as, as a tool um, to help me get through a lot. And um, that span for me from the time frame uh, until I was, well, 13 years old until I was, you know, roughly uh, 28, you know, I'm 46 now. Um, was was fraught with destroyed relationships and destroyed mm -hmm. careers and you know all the things that go along with all that and um, and uh, I, not that I didn't always work hard and I was always you know successful at what I did but somehow I'd always burn it down you know what I mean so it kind of yeah. led in the direction of that uh, for me personally um, yeah. and and so. Um, and I have a background of, you know, a lot of family members with a lot of addiction, a lot of family members, a lot of mental health issues, um, you know, and so uh, did it come easier for me because of those things? I, I don't know. Maybe, maybe not. I have family members, siblings that don't have the issue yeah. and I do. So I don't know. It, it maybe, I don't know how that all works with genetics. <laughs> um, so, but um, yeah, I, I did, I, I figured out that there was a lot of freedom in helping other people um, get better. And when I figured that out, my whole life shifted. Yeah. Well, one of the greatest things you can do for any kind of mental health problem at all, and, and Melissa and I are always telling people that suffer from kind of dark times, go out and help somebody else. You yeah. know, like it doesn't yeah. mean it'll go away, but it certainly is going to alleviate a lot of it. Right. Because you're not self-focused. It's not this self-absorption, you know, anyway. Yeah. It's kind of hard to be self-absorbed and self-centered when you're, you know, giving, giving to somebody else. <laughs> right. So, yeah. so it's, you know, and being there for somebody else and helping somebody else. So, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you talked about the 90 day program. I, 
and and how much more effective we found that that is. My, my I'm intrigued to learn, Justin, if the 30 day treatment has been historically proven to not be as successful. My question is, what happens to the brain during this process? What happens after 30 days of, the, of this type of work, 60 days and then 90? What's the triple like what happens in that extra 60 days that triggers the change from a program being predominantly not successful to greater chance of being successful? OK, so uh, I'm not a clinician. OK, I'm not a, I'm not a doctor. Uh, but I've, I've been around it long enough to understand. And I had have some great doctors and some great clinicians that work for me. And that helped me understand what it, what the difference is between 30 day and, and also just under th understanding through my own experience of going yeah. through 30 day treatment versus going through long-term treatment. Um, the outcomes were completely different. That said, um, I always like to use, well, first and foremost, like, SAMHSA, which is a very large organization in the United States that kind of deals with mental health. Yeah. They they have a, the statistics on all this stuff. But basically, from my understanding, the last statistic I saw on 30-day treatment was anywhere from 8 to 13% success rate. Wow. So, really? so just FYI, there are statistics out there. If you make it to a year uh, of continuous sobriety, the only known study that I know of is another SAMHSA study, which is 82.5% success rate of, of achieving permanent lifelong sobriety. After just a year, no matter just how long you've been long. addicted before? That's correct. Wow. Interesting. That's correct. promising. Well, Interesting. that's averaged. I'm sure yeah. that's yeah. average. No, I get it. That's you know, promising. No, but that's... But that's very good. So, so your program is designed to get you to the year, right? Yes. To get you to that place where you are, have the confidence yeah. to like take that forward. That's so, that's impress. It's impressive and it's important. It's important. Yeah, and there's people to and there's understand always, that it is a process. There's always variance. You know, obviously, you have somebody that has severe brain damage. You have somebody that has severe addiction maybe they've been addicted for 30 years or something to uh, some severe drugs you may the outcome may skew in those in those instances and it may 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 take longer yeah you yeah. know what i mean um and what that person's going to need when it is skewed or what you know obviously when somebody has you know some kind of something on the spectrum or if they're having any kind of schizophrenia issues yeah. or if there's there's always going to need to be help and they're always going to have to be taken care of to some degree. I mean, it's just a, a reality there that, that you can't get around. Um, and so we deal with those things um, the best we can and try to outfit families to deal with them and, and to help understand how addiction fits into the, to the grand scheme of those dual diagnosis issues. That there's said, I, I always like to use the, the, um, the analogy of the stroke. Okay. I don't know if you've ever known anybody that's had a stroke. Yep. It's a, you see a visual representation of the neurological damage that happened during that instant, which is from epoxia and from also all other issues that have happened. Um, and it's kind of varies from person to person, right? So like if somebody's had a stroke, you know, within the first year, um, that's when the majority of the healing happens, okay? Right. And then in the, in the four years after that, you're going to see a little bit of, of healing happen, okay? And I don't know the statistics on this, but you can kind of see it. You know, somebody, they do all the training, they tie the hand behind their back, they do all the stuff that gets people's brain retrained and get the, get them going, Again, mm -hmm. which is kind of what we do with our patients. We're, we're training their brain to figure out new pathways to work, okay? Mm -hmm. And what we're dealing with is brain damage. You know what uh, I mean? Yeah. So at, at the end of the day, drugs and alcohol cause brain, brain damage. Yeah. To what extent happens, how it happens with, with each individual and what how much drugs they've been using is really different from person to person. But that said... Um, a lot of damage can be healed in the first year if we train the brain and get the brain to move and think and, and move in different directions. 
So it's overwhelming do you do how resilient that is. Go ahead. It's overwhelming how resilient the brain is. Yeah. It's, do you do that resilient. through neuro, do you do that through neural therapy or or brain so brain training do, at all or we do EMDR. Right. Um, okay. We did we did for years we did neuro and biofeedback. We did right. that for a long time. We found that to have some some we wanted to move things that really kind of moved the needle. Yeah. And, um, you know, some things move it just a little bit, uh, other things move it a lot more. I feel like, um, you know, working with other people, um, uh, you know, see, uh, cognitive behavioral therapy, um, DVT, um, uh, all the different types of therapies that the counselors use, uh, along with physical fitness, um, actually getting people's heart rate up above a certain rate for 30 minutes every single day, you'd be surprised at how much that in and of itself, more so than any drug and a lot of yeah. counseling that we can give them, moves the needle on helping the brain and the body heal. Um, you know, the psychological stuff of training people how to think again, how to, how to you know, it, it, we're dealing with people that a lot of times are, you know, it's not about rehabilitation, it's about habilitation. You know what I mean? And so yeah. and giving them the ability to do things and, and you know, giving them better pathways to think about things and, and helping them and empowering them to become something that they've never become before. That's what we get to do in a long-term treatment program. That's, that's, our, that's our privilege. We get to help them learn over an extended period of time. I think that's where you get into the real benefit of working with people is because you have a lot of life scenarios that happen in that time frame. Absolutely. Yeah. No, it's so it's so encouraging and and I love that you say that the physical fitness and I'm sure food has a lot to, you know, cuz we all those of Absolutely. us that are into, you know, and Melissa and I are are big proponents of this, but that it's everything you do, but the body and the mind are not disconnected. You ha if you don't take care of this, your brain can't be taken care of and vice versa. That's, that's right. Yeah. 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 And so, yeah, I mean, as far as the longevity, like somebody finding that permanent sobriety, that's, that's where we see the most healing happen really in the first year to go back to your questions uh, uh, and, and understanding that that time frame is so critical to keep people engaged and to keep people um you know, working on themselves, challenging their old belief systems, moving in directions that are healthy, taking on healthy actions, you know, getting out, going to the doctor, taking care of themselves, getting a job, you know, moving the direction of healthy relationships and, and then like all the, all the different areas of the, the biopsychosocial aspect of, of dealing with somebody. So. I think um, from my own experience, I have family members who have suffered from addiction and the biggest challenge that I've witnessed is when they um, re-enter their their civilian life, if you will, outside of the rehab, or if they were locked up outside of the institution, whatever that institution looks like. When they when they re-enter, them not understanding how to reintegrate into their everyday life with their current environment, with their family members, with the existing friends they had, and so the fact, the sheer fact that you bring family in and make that a part of it from the get is so huge because i i've witnessed um a family member of mine come come out of rehab mm -hmm. same friends were hanging around same family members had the same responses that were triggering him whenever he would have an issue and i thought gosh if they would all have had if they could have all gone in because it wasn't a solo incident as you pointed out in the mm -hmm. beginning justin this is a family issue and mariel said it too everyone mm -hmm. is a part of this even if only one person is suffering init initially yeah so it's huge the, fa the family piece is massive and, and uh, Dr. Brian Sanford, he's a uh, uh, both a, a master level clinician, a PhD and LCDC and he's my executive director um, at the Arbor and he's amazing. He's, you know, family studies is kind of how his specialty is, is the, you know, systems, yeah. how the family system works together and how creating the environment for the for the patient to be successful is a family endeavor 
and um, and we we put a lot of time and effort uh, over the last fourteen years in both developing family program for an, an ongoing support while the while the person's in treatment, an intensive family program that's on site. We also have a Zoom um, that we do once a week with family that over 150 family members are on um, every week. And nice. um, that breaks out into individual sessions as well. And the, the feedback that the families that have, we have families that are on there that their family members have already gotten out of the arbor, but it's an open format, kind of like a, a, um, an Al-Anon meeting. Yeah. Um, right. You know, so it's right. a meeting format and, right. but it's just for, you know, loved ones of the patients that have been through the arbor. And so that in and of itself, that, that helps people hear, um, oh yeah, you know, listen to Dr. Sanford when he says something about this and I didn't listen to him and, and this is what happened and, you know, listening and, and, and taking the cues from family members that have been there. That's yeah. such a huge piece because not only do the patients have a hard time trusting, but the families have been pretty burnt on sure. trusting, trusting people. And That's an so, additional support piece. That's a huge layer. It's That's a huge piece. It's not the core of the family program, but it's, it's definitely yeah. something that's open to uh, them to log on to, you know, years after they get away from what's going on. And so they yeah. can come back. And then we have also the Harbor Families Institute, which is in Austin. We recently opened this up over the past uh, year and a half. And this is more of an intensive um like, so if we have family members or a group of family uh, loved ones that are involved in somebody's life, their they're significant other, and they're really just having a hard time with codependency, and they have uh, like just some really intense um, uh, traumas and, and some other pieces that are just not going to work out in the settings that were provided, you know, then they really need some intense individual work then the Arbor Family Institute is, is what we opened and we opened that up so they can come in and, and work directly week to week, day to day, whatever the actual uh, prescribed amount of interaction is gonna be needed. And are you, are you serving all types of families of all kinds of incomes and are you across the board or? Oh, yeah. yeah, oh yeah. I mean, we're a for-profit facility. I mean, we're not a non-profit facility, um, but we definitely, we help a lot of people, you know, and uh, we have currently at the Arbor, we have um, 58 beds. So wow. that's, it's a pretty big facility compared to yeah. Yeah, uh, California is. facilities. Yeah. Um, and then uh, from there we have, uh, I would say 50 to 60 um, beds that are, more so located in the city as far as you know sober livings and then yeah. we have an intensive outpatient program that we actually have people go to once they get out um, they continue on uh, and, and get and get care at night when they're not working and, and that sort of thing wow. so it's a pretty like all-encompassing program I feel like it's it has that it has a lot of you know softball nights it has a lot of fun things that we do together with that with all the clients it has a lot of really great things that happen both in treatment and also post-treatment nice kind of create the culture and the environment for yeah. people to really feel comfortable um, and actually you know start to integrate into a healthy community that's amazing yeah yeah it's been it's been fun <laughs> i, I it's bet challenging I, take to I take a guy out of uh take an old marine and a construction management guy and put him into the counseling world. It was a huge uh, vertical. <laughs> when, you, when, you inter, when you find the old Marine, be sure to introduce him to us because the guy we're talking to is much younger. So watch it. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Thanks. You're not I that, appreciate yeah. that. You're talking to two ladies that whatever. We're a little bit older <laughs> than you. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Anyway, that is awesome. I have a, I have just one kind of last question for you. Uh -huh. A per, slight, slightly personal question. Oh, do you feel, you know, because everybody says, 
you know, the 12 step program, you're like every day you're hi, I'm, I'm Justin, I'm Mary and I'm, I'm an addict or whatever you say. Right. Do sure. you feel that every day is a struggle for you? Do you, do you still like wonder, like, you know, like, do you ever long to have a drink or do anything? No. Or is that just way not part of your life? No, not, not for me personally. I mean, wonderful. I am no, so I just, filled with, I'm just filled with joy, you know, with being able to help people. And a lot yeah. of people that I help, um, I'm filled, they're filled with joy, the same joy of, of being able to be of service. Yeah. And, um, you know, I also think that a yeah. lot of people that have suffered themselves when they are put in position to become counselors or become people that help other people, it's like the greatest gift to them in like kind of opening that long-term door that won't ever shut because they know, they know the difference. They can feel the difference. And I guess too, you've created that neural pathway of joy, of appreciation, yeah. of gratitude. Right. So oh, yeah. that's cool. Yeah. And yeah. I've, I've learned a lot. I, I think I learned, you know, a lot about, you know, um, detaching with, you know, with love and yeah. You know, understanding that, you know, some, some folks, I mean, over the years, we, I've known a lot of people that haven't made it, you know, and, and uh, for a long time, I've got really attached to the result, you know, and yeah. beat myself up and, you know, yeah. um, you know, it's what they train a lot of counselors in their training is, is to help them detach and be objective and, and be there for people as they support. But I, you know, being a non-clinician, you know, kind of would get attached to the results and being like really, you know, it's yeah. tough, you know, dealing with all <laughs> this. And and so I, I learned to detach with love and and just to show up and be a service. And if they accept what we're what we're giving, great. If they don't, great. It all has to do with their journey. And yeah. uh, I love being a part of the journey. I'm going to use that an entire mantra when I'm dealing with my husband, when he irritates me, I'm going to show up and be of service. If you don't, if you don't agree with it, I'm going to detach. If you show up great. I actually like yeah. that. I'm giving you a hard time, but cause I'm going to use it on my husband, but I think it's great. Yeah. I think it's it being is. able to detach from something is the first rule of, of, of survival. If you get too yeah. attached to it, you're going to fall. I mean, I'm talking to a guy in the military from the military. You got to be able to pull away from it in order to survive. I, I think it's smart, but you you changed it by saying I'm showing up with joy and love in my heart. Yeah. 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 Right. Yeah. I think so many of us in the military detach and, and don't know how to replace that with something else. Yeah. Right. And, right. Um, and a lot of the detaching happens in a very traumatized way and it short circuits a lot of things. Yeah. And so, you know, we're excited. We're, you know, another thing I want to tell you guys is that we recently, over the last year and a half, we got TRICARE as an insurance. Wow, that's huge. And yeah. so we're, we're in network with most insurance companies, but I've been working on TRICARE for yes. over a decade and I finally got them. Oh, so, congratulations. That's amazing. Yeah, yeah. And so I'm excited about to be able to help the military and their That's family. a huge thing. That's a huge so, thing. I, so. I have my father, my stepfather, and my father-in-law, all military guys. Yeah. And I, and I only know about TRICARE because I'm working with my father-in-law through some of his issues. So when you said it, I realized that's huge. It's huge. It's a huge piece. And I'm excited. You know, being oh, good a, congratulations. A, a Marine, you know, it's, it's like you know i've been asked why don't you don't you don't treat veterans like well they have a very specific insurance yeah <laughs> so, I, I well that is amazing i'm uh, congratulations on that that's a that's that that's a feather in your cap for you know it's not easy dealing with the insurance companies and doing the you know oh, it's yeah. very complicated you think it seems so simple oh yeah you know, like i get covered no well yeah but oh, sort yeah. of and there's loopholes so well done and justin what a pleasure to have you yeah absolutely here to to talk to you and and talk about your journey and this amazing you know the arbor uh behavioral health out just outside of austin texas and george george Town? Georgetown. I'm 20 minutes north of Austin. So That's kind amazing. of a, a suburb of Austin. I see one of your kids. <laughs> Sorry, I got your little little kids. Kids. All I have is little girls. So you Two see some girls. I've met your little girls. They're so precious. They're <laughs> amazing. 
and by the way, Melissa, probably like your kids were, but I didn't know them back then. They are the most polite kids I have ever met in my life. It was, it kind of blew me away. I was thinking, did I? Wait, whoa, how was <laughs> I with the kids? <laughs> but they're beautiful kids and beautiful wife. You have a wonderful family. And thank, thank you. you again, Justin, so much. It's just a, a treat to have you on here. The Arbor Behavioral Health Center. Georgetown, uh, Texas. Is that correct? That's correct. The Arbor, okay. Georgetown. And, and just the arbor.com is where you can the find it. The so, so go there for information. As you know, you're, part, you're helping the Mariel Hemingway Foundation, which is going to become a resource navigator. And of course, we will have the Arbor on in our, you know, Rolodex. In, okay, in, let me know if I can help. In digital that. terms. <laughs> Mariel and I may be joining the softball team. <laughs> oh, I like it. Come on down. We'd love to have you. <laughs> Thank um, you so much, Justin. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks for sticking around to Outcomes the Sun. This is Melissa Yamaguchi. I have, instead of a feng shui tip for you today, I have just an energy tip and, and not really a tip, a message that I want to share with you. Something I recently came across that I'm so excited about. Um, and it's the latest research neuroscientists have discovered and revealed the insane benefits of walking every single day for brain health and longevity. Now in feng shui and in, in, in the, the study and the practice of, of paying attention, paying attention to the balance of your life. I, I will tell you that exercise is only has only been really paid attention to in the course of studying feng shui in modern times. Because before it was really in, in the old days of the original, the thousands of years ago when feng shui originated, it was really about focusing on the work and the labor you did in the field and on really maintaining. So labor was not, your exercise was through tilling the soil and, and take, grooming your horses and taking care of your home. It wasn't, it wasn't going to a gym and getting on an elliptical machine. So when fast forward now, and we talk, when we talk about in feng shui, when they talk about exercise, it's oftentimes what clothing you're wearing that may inter, may entice you to exercise harder or what color is the gym and how where are you placing things and what's your view all important stuff i'm not here to poo poo it. But when I was reading an article about neuroscientists revealing the insane benefits of walking every single day and not li li living a sedentary life. I start thinking about how we can train that back to the messages of feng shui and creating balance because really. The core message of feng shui is creating balance in your life. Is there, do you spend equal amount of times in your professional life as you do personal? Maybe you should do personal a little bit higher. Are you, are you balancing out the way you eat? Are you balancing out your sleep? Is your room conducive to good sleep? It's all these little tricks of the trade in feng shui. But for modern times, approach to exercise. If you are one who says, look, Melissa, I'm too strapped to even deal with the gym right now, uh, or I don't have the time to go drive to a gym. There's not one near me, whatever the, whatever it is, I respect that. But if you, if we know the benefits and the energy gained through the body from walking alone, put your shoes on and get out and start moving. The, the, not only does it increase your creativity, not only does it increase your blood flow, blood flow, it has been proven to extend your life seven and eight years if you'll just walk 20 30 minutes every day you don't have to break a hard sweat it's nice if you get a little glisten on your body because then your body your heart rates is up and you're moving so i would say that in order to create this incredible balance in your life take full advantage of the latest we know that walking is good for us but learning what it does for it i just want to give a little bit of it people who walk 7500 steps a day minimum Reduce, none like Marielle, who does 4,000 steps, 400,000 steps a day, 7,500 <laughs> steps a day, reduce their risk of all cause mortality and are less likely to suffer from major depressive disorders. Walking is one of the most fundamental actions attributed to humans, yet our modern lifestyles do not promote this activity. It has incredible health benefits and is one of the most underrated and low cost activities that can be added to your daily routine to promote longevity and prevent aging. Well, I will tell you that in all of my, I've been studying feng shui 28, almost 29 years. 
and I've never heard, I've never read or heard one thing about exercise. Now, there are movements that you'll learn through the, the Chinese medicine that you need to do certain pounding on the legs to promote good activity in your spleen or your kidneys and really massaging the feet and so forth. But as far as, and there's certainly Tai Chi, but as far as getting the heart rate up and really moving it, I, I've not read a lot to it. So I would like to modernize my message on energy for you today and say, take the messages that we got about walking and what it, how good it is for you overall. Let's extend that concept of balance by getting the heart rate up so that the body can live longer and you can Put a little bit more plants in the southeast corner if that's what feng shui calls for you to do. Thanks for sticking around. Don't go anywhere. Mariel Hemingway is coming up with tips on health. Thank you so much, Melissa. Yes, I'm Mariel Hemingway, and I do have a tip on um, balance. But you know what? I can't. I can't let you bring up movement without just jumping on the bandwagon because you brought up. You brought up walking and it is imperative for all of the reasons that you said, and especially, you know, your physical, obviously your cardiovascular health, health improves, you can lose weight, you can do all kinds of things just from walking, just movement itself. We are designed as animals to move. We are designed to move. We are not designed to be sedentary and sit at desk jobs for prolonged period periods of time. It's why people have stand-up desks. It's why we, you know, we know as 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 a culture that you know movement is good for us, but it is good for your body and your brain. It's so incredibly important to change the mental thoughts. And you know, our guests talked about it. It's like getting their getting people who are in recovery to do physical jobs helps their brain. You know, when you start oxygenating the brain cells as well as the body cells, that will change neural pathways. It will increase their ability to be able to handle the stresses, the anxieties, and all of that. Because, you know, really your mental your movement will create such a sense of mental well-being. It, you know, it does relieve stress. It improves your memory. Movement improves your memory. People that are worried about their senility as they move into, you know, mature ages, look, really look at your food, but really look at your movement, really make an effort. And, you know, and that will just lead me to, and I say it probably every time, do it once in a while with your shoes off, get grounded. You know, uh, uh, Justin was talking about grounding into these practices. And I kept thinking, I kept putting it, okay, well, let's do that outside. <laughs> let's sit on the grass and have a meeting. Let's, you know, like absorb what nature has to offer. But that movement is so incredibly important for our brains. It's just, it, there's nothing could be more important. I watch my partner, Bobby Williams, every single morning, he has to move. And he's under a tremendous amount of stress right now because he's got this big business that he's, he's launching. And, you know, there's a tremendous amount of pressure in his life. But if he doesn't get to move in the morning, he can't handle those pressures. Movement allow, you know, it, it activates your blood. It, it keeps your blood moving through your body in a better way. And people of a of a spiritual nature or even a religious nature will say taking a walk around the block if you're feeling depressed or anxious will shift that energy, getting back to energy that Melissa was talking about, and improve your mood, change your mood, shift it from anxiety and you know despondency to a to a feeling of joy, a feeling of of excitement or even just shift it into a place of I can accept where I am right now. You know, maybe you're not going to feel, oh, I feel fantastic now, but you're going to feel different, which is going to feel better than this place of darkness. So yes, thank you for bringing up walking, Melissa, because it is so incredibly important for everybody to do it. And you don't have to do 400,000 steps, which by the way, I've never done, but <laughs> <laughs> I'll work on it. Um, you don't have to do, it's not about 
quantity. It's about the quality of that movement. Movement in my in my first book, maybe it was my second book. Uh, I have a book called uh, Marielle Hemingway's Healthy Living from the Inside Out, and I talked about twenty minutes of intentional movement is better than an hour workout because with intention, if you have a focus on what you're doing, when you're doing it, being present to that movement, it can shift your body exponentially rather than going on the elliptical, watching the television, watching yeah. the news, not paying attention to what your body is doing in that moment. Now it's tempting. And once in a while I've gotten on my Peloton and watched a television show i'm not gonna lie but but the truth is when you do exercise with the intention of being completely you know immersed in that activity it changes everything and you get the results of an hour or an hour and a half workout in a much shorter period of time so that's it that's all i have for on walking and so grateful you brought that up melissa and Thank you everyone for being here today. What what a fun and interesting episode for us. And I can't wait. I can't, you know, I just can't wait till the next one. I know. <laughs> I'm just going to stay up all night. Oh my God. Like I'm like I'm waiting outside a rock concert tickets. What's going to happen? <laughs> Where are we going? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, everyone. I'm Marielle Hemingway with Melissa Yamaguchi. Remember, you're connected to the Marielle Hemingway Foundation, a resource navigator for mental health. It's what we're trying to create. If you're trying to look online and see what that is, it hasn't been created yet, but we, we do us. have a site. It's called Marielle Hemingway Foundation.org. So if you want to look at it, you can do that. And if you want to donate, you can do that there. But just remember that that's really our aim is to create this place where you can go and find what you need for your mental health struggles or issues.